Hallelujah. Praise God. I think I started out that way every time. I've been watching myself on the videos. I'm surprised how consistent I am. But um, praise the Lord. Just ask you, Lord, to just, um, just be present in this teaching, Lord God. And, and I want it to be your words. I want it to be your direction. Um, I know I'm kind of going out on a limb away from what traditional teachers have taught with regards to these things. And I keep kind of repeating them from a little bit different angles over and over, but um, I just I just want it to be your way, and it just seems so obvious what's your way, and it's not the the traditional way that I've been taught over the years, but uh, it's clear in your word, and um, I'm beginning to see other pastors, Father, that uh, that are are seeing it also. So I'll just give you the praise and the glory, and ask you to guide us in Jesus' name, Amen. So the title is the 144,000, the rapture and the wedding revelation uh, in chapter 7 of Revelation. Um, the 144,000, the rapture and the wedding in Revelation chapter 7. Um, we'll get to the 144,000 today, and I've gone over this before, so it's not entirely new if you saw it maybe a year ago, maybe less. Um, the rapture. And we'll get through that. And again, what this is just an overview. I'm not going into a lot of detail on each one, but it's just an overview so that we can move ahead into the wrath of God in chapter Revelation chapter 9 and uh, through 8 and 9. So um, let me uh, just begin. Like I said last week, we should be in Revelation 9, but not quite yet. Last week I began an overview and we ended it with Revelation 6.13 the great earthquake, the stars dropping from heaven, and the sky rolled up as a scroll. Um, Revelation 6, 14, then the sky receded as a scroll, and when it rolled up, every mountain island was moved out of its place. Um, and I said last week, we kind of explained the earthquake, the stars dropping from heaven, and um, gave some historical examples of some pretty powerful earthquakes. and and some uh, examples of how meteors and things were dropping from a particular part of space. But, uh, and then I said, I'm not sure when we'd ever get to the scroll receding. I'm not sure I have anything that I can pin down on that yet. Um, I'm praying and working on it, but uh, I haven't found anything conclusive. And I said, I, we didn't have any conclusion yet about the sky receding or scroll. So in our overview, overview we're gonna move on to chapter seven and then eventually eight, the minute, 30 minute pause, the 144,000 and the wedding. So today we're gonna to talk about the 144,000, the rapture and just begin to touch on the wedding. I wanna give the wedding a whole uh, session because um, there's so much there that we have not been taught because yes, it's the actual wedding not to be confused with the reception party that scriptures call the wedding supper of the lamb. I know that most people just conclude that the wedding supper of the Lamb is the wedding, but it's not. It's the reception after the wedding. And the wedding, we'll get to a little bit of that, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But next week, I really want to go into more detail of why the wedding is kind of secluded and why it's there. But uh, and anyway, but let me first get back up a little bit to segue into chapter 7. And I'm going to go back into 6 because you're going to see what's going on. But Revelation 6, 12, I look when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as fig trees dropped its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded, as I spoke in a minute ago, and the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid, himself, hid themselves in caves and in the rocks and the mountains and said to the rock, mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. And I said last week, isn't it ironic that... Um, we're becoming more and more, we're becoming more and more a, a people of this world that worships nature, um, which is kind of interesting because that's what a lot of ancient religions did, but um, we're kind of progressing backwards into that. We call it climate change and diff different names. And when I was younger, it was the big ice age was returning and then that didn't work out. So now it's called 
climate change. So, you know, it's, um, but I, I thought it's interesting because I, I th I've thought in the past that they hid under the rocks in the mountains because they wanted to die because of the wrath of, of God was coming. But now I look at it and I wonder, are they, are they really hiding in their, are they really hiding in the, the God that they worship, the rocks, the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne? Um, but the wrath of the Lamb, uh, from verse 16, the end of verse 16, the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is really important that it's coming at this point after the sixth seal. This is the sixth seal being opened. And when that's opened, uh, two things here that I want to talk about. Obviously, this is Jesus returning to the earth, the Lamb of God, who paid the price to redeem us and take back the earth from Satan, which was originally given to man by God. Do you get that? Obviously, this is Jesus returning to earth, the Lamb of God, who paid the price to redeem us and take back the earth from Satan, which was originally given to man by God. So Jesus has paid the price as the Lamb of God to redeem the earth back to him. So we're in the sixth seal, and the seventh seal is the next one, and then the whole scroll will be opened. So um, th this, is, this is when Jesus is coming back. Uh, and, and the second thing, uh, this is the first mention of the wrath of God coming to earth. I want to really emphasize that. This is the this is the first mention of the wrath of God coming to earth. So all the previously mentioned seals and the the whatever came from the seals are not, and I repeat, are not and cannot be considered God's wrath. Uh, and the reason I emphasize that is because the people that believe in pre-tribulation believe that the whole seven years of Daniel, seven years is is the wrath of God, but it's obviously not. I mean, it's so clear that it's not. And um, Jesus in his Olivet Discourse, he, he outlined the whole thing in, in very general terms. Now it's more detailed, but and then in, as we get into 12 and on, it'll even get more detailed. But um, this is not the appointed wrath. This is not the God. This is not God's wrath because we're not appointed to wrath. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we must conclude we are gone when the wrath befalls the earth. We have to be gone by the time this wrath befalls the earth. But this is interesting because look what it says, Mark 13, 24. But in those days after the tribulation, did you hear what I just said? After the tribulation, now Jesus is talking about the great tribulation. After that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming. You get that? In those days, after the tribulation, after that tribulation, he's talking about the great tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And in the Old Testament, over and over again, it says that the day of the Lord, the moon will not give its light, the heavens will be, the sun will be darkened, the heavens, uh, the stars of the heavens will fall, and the power of darkness, uh, the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That's over and over in the Old Testament describing the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord comes as his wrath comes. That's it's God's day to take out his vengeance on those who stole his earth. See, he he created man, Adam and Eve, gave us the earth, gave us dominion over it. And in the fall, we were tricked by Satan and unfortunately our pride and and uh, lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes all, all got in the way. But but Satan knew what buttons to push and he pushed the buttons and we by default, gave him the, the land, gave him the earth, gave him the property. And we know that because he used that as leverage to try and get Jesus to fall. Uh, he offered him different things with the, pride of, with the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. He tempted him in all three of those ways, just as Adam and Eve were. But um, he didn't fall. And later he paid the price to get it back. He redeemed the earth for us. So what this is saying, after the, those days, after that tribulation, after the great tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. These are all things described throughout the Old Testament as the day of the Lord, the day of his vengeance. 
Um, then he will send his angels and gather together. This is interesting. Then the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And I'm going to talk about him coming in the clouds in a minute. But coming in clouds with great power and glory. Because when he was ascended into heaven, the, the disciples that were standing there, they, the angels came and said, don't worry, he's coming back just like he did. But I'm going to talk about the clouds in just a minute. So the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then we will, he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven then he will send his angels and gather together now when is he gathering together his elect right he's gathering together his elect after that tribulation after the wrath of god is beginning to be poured out on earth is preparing to be poured on earth because we don't we're not we're not appointed to wrath we'll be taken out of there then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven so he's going to get us all out of there and then jesus i want to jesus is describing to the disciples in a very chronicle chronological list of the events that will take place excuse me prior to his return and when he says that and he says after that tribulation he's speaking about the great tribulation after that tribulation and that great tribulation which he talked about in the Olivet Discourse also it comes after the uh, the Antichrist takes up this place in the throne and claims he's God and it's halfway through Daniel's last week three and a half years into Daniel's week it's not there's not anything about a seven-year tribulation and the seven-year tribulation is certainly not the wrath of God of course see that's the the premise that the pre-trib people use um, on us leaving before the quote seven-year tribulation which isn't in the Bible but they're saying that we leave before that because the seven years of tribulation are the wrath of God and we're not appointed to wrath. And that's not true at all. We've talked about this over and over again. The first four seals were loosed 2,000 years ago because we know that because the John's gospels, John's epistles, excuse me, John's letters specifically talks about the, the spirit of Antichrist coming out and that was the first horseman. And we know that the wars and, and rumors of wars has been increasing, increasing just like the woman uh, preparing for childbirth. It's just exactly how Jesus told us it would happen in the exact order that he told us it would happen in. So if Jesus, so if Jesus comes for us just uh, as the wrath of God is going to be poured out, where are we when God's wrath, known as the day of the Lord, begins? Where are we then? Jesus comes for us. He, he comes in the air and he raptures the saints out of the world. We, you, you know, where are we when God's wrath? Well, it says in the Bible. Let's see. Revelation 7, 9. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes and people and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with, with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. It says after these things, after these things happen after the great tribulation after the the star the sun and the moon turn dark and all that goes on it says after these things how can you I, I don't know how you can put this before it when it says after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations tribes and people and tongues standing before the lamb before the uh, throne before the lamb clothed with white robes and I know that the pre-tribulation people like to call this the tribulation saints, but it just ain't, it ain't going to happen. It doesn't happen that way. It's not that way in the Bible. You can't, you got to twist and turn at every turn to try and make it say these things that they say, that it says. So after these things, what's after these things? If I say it's, I'm going to do something after these things, does that mean I do it before these things? No, it says, means I'm going to do it after. These. So back to beginning of Revelation 7-1, we see what Jesus is telling us is going on before he comes to get us. 7-1, we're going to look and it says, it says before he comes to get us. I'll tell you, it's all here and it's very specific and simple to understand in chronological order. Revelation 7-1, after these things, Oh, just a second. 7-1. Let me go back to that. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Now, after these things, right? 
I, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or, the, or on the tree. So they're holding back the wrath of God. They're holding back. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was granted to harm the earth. <clears throat> And the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I've heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000, all of the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So now what are we going on here? What we got to go on? There's angels. There's four angels at the corners of the earth ready to loose the wrath of God on the earth. And, he, and he's just stopping everything. The wind will not blow, the sea or any trees anywhere on the earth. Another angel descends, ascends from the east. And now remember, he's ascending from the east. And I've said this before. This other angel, the fifth angel, is ascending from the east. So where is he if he's ascending from the east? He's on earth. He's certainly not in heaven. So how could we be sealing the 144,000 down on earth as Jews saved during the tribulation time or some crazy concocted thing they got up with, the angels ascending from the east. He's coming up and he's got the seal of the living God. He's going to seal the 144,000. If he's coming up to where John is and John's in heaven looking at all this stuff, then where is that angel coming from and where is he going to? And where's the 144,000? If he's coming up to seal them, then they're in heaven. And then it goes on, it says, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed, of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed, of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed, of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed, of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed, of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed, the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed, the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed, the tribe of Ishgar, 12,000 were sealed, the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed, and the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed, and of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So before we before we see the great multitude in heaven worshiping at the throne, the 144,000 are identified and sealed in, in Revelation 7-9 says, after these things, we're going to see this great multitude in heaven after these things. So before we go on, let me briefly disguise, describe where the 144,000 came from and why they're sealed. And I've said this before, but I, I just want to drill this into people's heads. They came from Abraham's bosom. The paradise, Jesus told the thief on the cross, he would be with him that day. Remember on the cross, the, 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 I guess you'd call him the repentant thief, maybe not the good thief, but the repentant thief, who said, you know, Jesus doesn't deserve to be here, but we do. So he admitted he was a sinner. And then, and then he said, remember me when you get into your kingdom. So you recognize Jesus was God and a king in his kingdom. And Jesus said, uh, you'll be with me today in paradise. And where was paradise? Abraham's bosom. They're all waiting. These are all the people in the Old Testament and in faith trusted God for their salvation, not understanding exactly what was going to come or how it was going to happen or even when it was going to come. But they're waiting in paradise. But they can't go. They can't leave Abraham's bosom and go to heaven because there hasn't been a redemption yet. They haven't been redeemed. Jesus' blood had to pay for their sin so they could get to heaven, right? So they came out of their graves when Jesus resurrected from his. Listen to this. This is very important. The chronological order is just so clear. Matthew 27, 51, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn uh, in two from top to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. But listen to this. They were raised. Their graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Coming out of their graves, in other words, they, they were raised, their, their grave stones were rolled back, their bodily there, the many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after, but didn't come out of the graves until after Jesus resurrected. They couldn't come out of their graves until Jesus first resurrected. And then he went into the holy, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. 
They were part of what's called the first fruit offering Jesus took to heaven to present to his father. Now, this may sound redundant if you've been in my teachings before, but this is important that you get this in your head because you've had the other garbage drummed into your head for I don't know how many years since you were first born again or when you were a child in, hell, in Sunday school or whatever. They were all in lockstep together with the stuff that wasn't in the Bible. So they were part of the first fruit offering Jesus took to heaven to present to his father. Now you say, how do you know that he went to heaven to present this to this father? John 20, 17, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me for I've not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God, which happened before he met his disciples. So did these Old Testament have to die again? No, Jesus ascended to heaven in a great cloud in the Old Testament saints as they were described in Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, we also since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So I guess I went that went a little too fast that way, but these guys, these people were part of the first fruit that Jesus was going to present to God. Now I want you to listen to something here. The first fruits in the in the harvest is barley and barley is is a rougher grain it's not as sweet and tasty and all that it's a it's a whole different thing but that's what comes up first the barley does so he took the barley the rough the rough guys the rough people whatever the the, the his family his people his chosen ones he took them up and presented them to god as the first fruit he presented himself as first fruits as man as the redeemed man that paid the price, the Lamb of God. But then he presented them as first fruits, as Melchizedek, the, the, the God become man. He was, he was the, the, yeah, he was the guy that presented, he was the, the Levite that the did the offering, you know, praise, or presented the offering. Melchizedek, he was the he was the first one and Jesus came as Melchizedek back in Abraham's day and now he's going to take these people and as the high priest just as the high priest would present um, and that's what Melchizedek was our high priest he's going to present these people to God as the first fruits now and people say well these these there's always a controversy did these old testament saints who walked the earth some people like to take that out and say well that is not really in the bible it shouldn't be there take out matthew 27 that shouldn't even be there but then other people are saying well let's ask then if they did come out of the graves what happened to them did they go and then they had to die again just like lazarus probably died again it, it, did they just go and and live out a little bit more life and die again um, what, what happened to them exactly? Did they just kind of fade and vanish away when Jesus resurrected? No, it says, it says Jesus ascended into heaven in a great cloud, and, and which I believe is the Old Testament saints because it's, they're described that way in Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, it, it, and there's many other places, but th this is one I'm just gonna, because I'm skimming through this, but just as the angels told, so therefore we also, since we're, so just as the angels told his disciples, when he went up, he would return the same way, right? In Revelation 1, 7, behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Notice, I just read that, Revelation 1, 7, you can look it up, behold, he's coming with clouds, that's interesting. He's coming with clouds. He left with clouds and he's coming back with clouds. Notice it doesn't say he will come in the clouds, but with the clouds. This time it's with the 144,000 who have been sealed. That's what I believe. And I believe that scriptures support that belief. Sealed, why are they sealed? Simply they had to be sealed because they left earth and went up to heaven as part of the first fruit offering, which was prior to Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to seal us, the church, the bride. Do you understand that? They had to be sealed. So the angel with the seals, he, he goes up and seals this 144,000 because at that point in time, the Holy Spirit is still here on earth and we're with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's in us and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what scripture says over and over. He's the seal of, our, of, the, of, of the proof that we belong to Jesus Christ, we're sealed. So they had to be sealed before they came back because if they came back to earth, um, 
I don't know what all kinds of things could happen because they aren't sealed. But if they weren't sealed, then, then they couldn't come back. So after these 144,000, which are heaven, were selected and sealed, Jesus took them with him to gather us together. Now, why did he take them with us to gather them together? Because it was prophesied that way. Because in the biblical, the biblical Jewish wedding, the groom was preceded by a coalition of his male friends to get the bride and her bridesmaids. And there's all kinds of parables about that, the ladies with the oil and without the oil and all that sort of stuff. But what happens is the, the bridegroom selects specific people with specific things and he, they go before him to meet up with the bridesmaids with the oil in their lamps, right? And, and they're virgins, the girls are virgins, the guys are virgins. They meet up there and, and they bring out the, the bride and they take her to the groom. Now the groom is with them, but they're, he's preceded by these, in this case, 144,000. Oh, Revelations 14, these are the ones, now listen to what it says. And you tell me if they were on earth, right? And then they were, uh, the, I, I don't know, I really don't even understand how they get this stuff, but they believe that they're on earth and they're selected out as 144,000 Jews to go and evangelize the people, to save the people that are, that are supposed to be the tribulation saints and all that stuff. But um, it, it, what does it say in Revelation 14 about these guys? These, talking about the 144,000, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Well, that's strange. How are they on earth redeeming people the, the, before, in the midst of the wrath of God, that what they call the wrath of God, which isn't the wrath of God. But it says, these were redeemed from men. Listen, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Did you hear what it says? They're the first fruits. The 144,000 are the first fruits. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. This is the, the, his, bride, his grooms, or whatever you want to call them. I don't know. But um, the lamb, he follow, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were, uh, they're not grooms. What they call groomsmen? Is that more accurate, I guess? These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. This is scripture. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So we know that they were selected out of the first fruits that Jesus told Mary Magdalene, don't cling to me, don't hold me here because I'm going to go to see my Father and present myself as the first fruits of man. And then as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, I'm going to pre present these other people as the first fruits. And then I'm going to select out of them 144,000 guys from each, 12,000 from each tribe that were not, they're not virgins, never been a woman, never been sinful. And so what does that say to me? You know, these have got to be little kids. And, you know, I'm sure they grew up <laughs> in some aspect, and I don't know how that works, but they, they must have grown up in some aspect when they were in uh, the Abraham's bosom. Um, we know they're alive and well and, and talking because the guy that was in in Sheol said, "Wouldn't you, you know, have Abraham just put a little bit of water on his and touch, you know?" And, and so we know there's something going on. But um, so uh, they may have been just kids. I don't know. Maybe they were just perfect little men. I don't know. But anyhow, they're the ones that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And so if they're in heaven and he's in heaven, I'm going to show you that they're in heaven because this is what it says, Revelation 14. Then I, 14, 1, then I looked, and it's so hard to understand. This is, it's, it's so hard. How hard is this to understand? It's so plain. Um, Revelation 14, 1, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now this Mount Zion is still in heaven. How do I know it's still in heaven? Because in Hebrew 12, 20 through 24, it talks about the heavenly Jerusalem in Mount Zion. I looked and behold a lamb. Now, where is, where, where, where is John when he's beholding this lamb? He's in heaven. And where is this lamb standing on Mount Zion, which we're told in Hebrews is a heavenly mountain, is a heavenly Jerusalem in Mount Zion, in heaven. And with him, <clears throat> he's still in heaven. And with 
him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like a voice of many waters, and like a voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of the harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except for the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. This is, this is evidently a song that these guys are going to, these groomsmen are going to sing as they precede Jesus to come down and get the bride. It's, it's so clear. But listen to what it says. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. Go find 144,000 Jewish guys that never have, never, but anyhow. And it says in the Bible, even if you thought it, you've done it. So it, it's, they haven't been defiled by women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Where are they? Before the throne of God. They're without fault before the throne of God. I, I mean, this is wild. But Hebrews 12, 22, let me read that to you, just in case you don't think I'm giving you a square shot here. Hebrews 20, 12, 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. What is this describing? You can tell this is describing heaven. This is, this is what they're describing. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. But listen, listen, who's with the innumerable innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who were registered in heaven they're written in their lambs they're written in the book right lamb's book of life they're registered in heaven to god the judge of all to the spirits of just made men made perfect to the to the spirits of just men made perfect to jesus the mediator of the new covenant you see what it's saying we're talking about we're talking about this general assembly is in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the heavenly Mount Zion. And so what we just read about where the 144,000 are, where are they? They're in heaven. And where are they? If you don't believe that, read verse 5. And in their mouth there was found a sheep, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Where's the throne of God? It's in heaven. So they're going to come down with Jesus and get his bride. So now, after these things, now we get back to Revelation 7, 9. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's a whole bunch of people. And again, the pre-tribbers say, oh, these are the, the, these are the recently second raptured group of people that they call the tribulation saints. There's nothing to support that at all. Revelation 7, 13 says that one of the elders answered me, saying, saying, answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed with white robes and where did they come from? Oh, okay, let's find out who they are and where they came from, all right? And I said to him, sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Okay, now just a second. This isn't the tribulation saints. These are us come out of the great tribulation because we just discovered that we're in the great tribulation and we don't come out until until uh, the wrath of God begins to fall. Jesus comes down, uh, raptures us, comes down with his 144,000, raptures the, the bride, and goes back to heaven, never quite landing on earth because he raptures us up to him in the sky with this great cloud. Whoa, the great cloud that went with him to heaven, the great cloud that came back with him. Oh, geez. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Now, this is very important, and I, I'm getting near the end, but I want you to see what it's going to what's going to happen next week. But okay, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. Remember, the great tribulation is only the last three and a half years. It's not this seven year thing that they talk about. That's not in the Bible. And washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. 
in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Very important. He who he who sits on the, therefore he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. And look what happens when they, he spreads his tent over them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. This is us. And the tent, and I'm going to get into lots of details about this next week, but the tent he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. The, the tent is in, in biblical history and in Jewish history, the tent is where they go to consummate the marriage. He will spread his tent over them. And after he spreads his tent over them, they'll neither hunger, thirst, sun won't hurt them. Lamb in the midst of the throne will lead them to the living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the bride of Christ. He'll spread his tent over them. Well, we've seen where and when the 144,000 come from, and we've seen the timing and the method of the rapture of the church. It's not seven, it's not a pre-trip thing. It's, it's right before the wrath of God begins to fall. That's when Jesus comes down, retrieves them. Now, this is important because the wrath isn't Jesus' wrath. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. This is God the Father who's going to get vengeance on the earth. The wrath of God falls at the end of the three and a half year great tribulation. And the great tribulation, it says it's supposed to be three and a half years. But for us, it's not three and a half years because he says that for the elect's sake, he'll cut it short. Right. So the, the end of the great tribulation, which is the, the tribulation of the Antichrist, at the end of that great tribulation, the wrath of God comes. But we're gone before that because it says for us it's cut short. Next we'll see his bride escorted to heaven with Jesus and his groomsmen taken into heaven to enter Jesus' tent and consummate their marriage and become eternally one with Jesus. And I'm going to talk about this. This is very important that we become one with Jesus. How in the world can we go into a sinless eternity with all of our human failings, with all of our fleshly failings, with our lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. How can we go into an eternal heaven like that? Then we'd always be on the edge. Is somebody going to botch this up and we're all going to go back and this is going to be played out all over again? No, we're going to be become one because we're the bride of Christ. And I'll get into this next week. But we're the bride of Christ. We become one with Jesus. And once we're one with Jesus, we can't fail. We won't be able to fail. So we don't have to worry about sin or anything like that. We'll be in great shape. So I've achieved two thirds of what I wanted to do. Next, I want to spend a whole session on the marriage, not the reception, but the actual wedding. Interestingly, we have all been sidetracked into thinking the marriage supper of the lamb is the wedding, but it's not. It's the celebration after the actual wedding. What you'll see next week is that the actual biblical wedding is very private between the bride and the bridegroom. And that's why little is said about it in scriptures. It's, it's almost secretively in, in the Jewish wedding in the Old Testament times, in the biblical, the, 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 the father would pick the bride. Oh, I don't want to get into this, but the father picks the bride. He selects the bride. The groom, the bridegroom pays the price. Then he goes and gets them when he has his place ready for them. And that's when he then he takes them. Then, then they come and they quietly go into the tent. Now, remember, they've already made their they've already made their covenant with each other. He gave us a new covenant. And I'm going to talk about this ne next week. A new covenant with uh, with the same old command. Just Deuteronomy six. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. And then Jesus added, and your neighbor is yourself. But, I mean, I'm going to talk about love next week. What love, what biblical love is. And I, I, so I've been struggling with it because I feel I'm far short of ever being able to talk about this love of Jesus. I, I just, I struggle with, with that. And, and I, I'm going to. I'm going to try and address it next week, probably in more practical terms than I can in emotional or uh, terms. But um, 
but we're going to analyze our, our faith in Jesus, where our faith is placed, and, and what he's really coming for. Who's he really coming for? Who's this bride he's coming after? What are they like? And we'll, we'll see that next week. And the reason that there's little said about it in the scriptures, this is a very private thing. It's a very private thing between Jesus, the bridegroom, and his bride, the church. The consummation of this marriage is where we become one with him and we live with him forever. And he takes care of us forever. And he leads us to living water that keeps us alive eternally and in relationship with him because we're one with him. We won't be able to sin. It just ain't going to happen. It can't happen. But none of this could have happened. None of this end that we're reading about could have happened if it didn't all start back with Adam and Eve six, seven thousand years ago. A little over six thousand years ago. How it all had to start with a fall, and it had to lead to an identified group of people. And it had to, that, that would be waiting in Abraham's bosom. Then it had, to, it had to culminate in the cross where Jesus says it's finished. I'll talk about the price for the bride. And it's paid in full. And then it goes, and then it goes to, he comes back and gets us and takes us to his tent and covers us with his tent. He takes us, takes us home to be with him. But the covenant was made before. The covenant was made by Jesus. And it's, originally it was... Uh, forecasted or prophesied in Jeremiah but then it's it's made with Jesus when he's on the cross and he talks about I'll talk about how he verbalizes this covenant it's interesting but he verbalizes the covenant to his bride and he speaks about being the bridegroom but um, but we do our end of it by accepting his marriage proposal that's what it really is when Jesus the Holy Spirit comes to us and lures us to Christ. It says we can only come because the Father selects us, but God has selected us all. I'm not into election. God has selected us all uh, through the grace of Jesus. It's in the Bible. But anyhow, we're all selected, but not everybody will accept the proposal. Because accepting the proposal says, I'm no longer me. I'm willing to, at that day in the wedding, at that day, you'll resurrect me. I'll be changed into a, a sinless person as I, I go up. But then when I consummate with Jesus, I can never sin again. And, and I, but anyhow, we become one and I'll never sin again. And um, no man can separate us. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. Once we become one with him, we're set. And so... Um, that's uh, that's what we're going to talk about next week, and uh, I don't want to get too far into it. I'm getting a little further into it than I really wanted to even, but but you see, we made we, we don't need the wedding vows. You know how you have the wedding vows now, where they stand up and say, "Do you do that? And you do that? And you do this? And you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah." We did that. Jesus presented his side of the wedding proposal. We accept it from our side, and that's done. So next, the thing is, the wedding must be consummated between us and Jesus Christ, and we become one with him when we go into the tent with him. He spreads his tent over us. And after that, I just read what happens after that. It's all, it's all cool. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on next week. Let me just read one little thing, because I want you to see what it says. In the Strong's Concordance, it says that that word tent, and you'll see in most translations will say, we'll have translated to a tabernacle or temple or something like that, but it's tent. That's the word that's there. It's, I can't say it, it's shikinu or something like that. It's 4637 in the Strong's Code coordinates. And it says properly to pitch or live in a tent, okay? That's what the word means, to pitch or live in a tent. Denoting much more than mere general notion of dwelling, right? Because it, in some translations it says we go and dwell in the tent with him. Denoting much more than mere general notion of dwelling. For the Christian, 4637, is dwelling in intimate communion with the resurrected Christ, even as he who himself lived in unbroken communion with the Father during the days of his flesh. That's what that word tent is. That's why I'm, I'm telling you it's a wedding tent. It's not just a tabernacle. It's not just something we go dwell with him in. 
and I'm going to get into much more details. It's, it's incredible. But um, 46:37, it's dwelling in intimate communion with the resurrected Christ. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We look forward to next week. I'm excited about talking about the wedding. And we just want to give you the glory. We want to give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. And we pray for those people that are listening that are struggling with these thoughts, Father, that they would go into the scriptures like the Bereans and study it for themselves. And I mean really study it, not just listen to what somebody else tells them to think about it, but that they would really study it, Father. And I praise you and I thank you and I give you the glory in Jesus' name. And we pray for those people who have not given their life to Christ, who have not accepted that wedding proposal from Jesus Christ, that they would admit their sinners in need of a Savior and give their life to Jesus Christ, accepting their eternal arrangement through the wedding and uh, with with Jesus Christ and we give you all the glory in Jesus name amen amen praise God